Thank you. A lot of challenges, and maybe Amira will help us navigate some more through these challenges in southern Sudan. It is a, a pleasure to have with us Amira Haq. Amira is the Deputy Special Representative of the UN Secretary General in Sudan, and she's also the Resident Humanitarian Coordinator of the United Nations in the country. Before serving in Sudan, Amira served as a Deputy Special Representative of the, the UN Secretary General in Afghanistan and also as the RCNHC in Afghanistan. Um, she was also in charge of the Relief, Recovery and Reconstruction um, area of work in, in Afghanistan. Prior to Afghanistan, she was the Deputy Assistant Administrator and Deputy Director of the Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery of UNDP. She's also served as a UN resident coordinator and UNDP resident representative in Malaysia and in Laos. Huge wealth of experience, Amira. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much. And let me also convey my thanks to uh, the Dutch government and ODI for uh, uh, the series of uh, discussions on, on fragile states. And <clears throat> I think I by the turnout in the, in, the, in the room, I can see that it is a topic that generates a, a, a lot of uh, interest, and I think it is so current in terms of trying to uh, define uh, what exactly is a fragile uh, state, uh, why do we call it fragile, and what do we need uh, to do, in a sense, to nurture uh, this, uh, this fragility and, and, and bring it out of this uh, situation. <coughs> so as um, <coughs> Luca has uh, you know, given you the perspective from, from, uh, from the, the government, I will uh, run through very quickly as, as, as I see uh, this whole challenge and debate around, um, around <coughs> early recovery. And let me um, start by uh, putting up a, a, a graph, I think, which, uh, which very clearly uh, I think depicts what uh, what Luca was talking about, and if we start from you know where the where the red uh, uh, curve is, uh, which is sort of during the war, as as Luca mentioned, you know humanitarian aid, as in the case of Southern Sudan with Operation Lifeline uh, Sudan, uh, you know the life saving, short term action, <clears throat> as you know humanitarian. Uh, uh, assistance is delivered on the principles of uh, international, uh, you know, uh, humanitarian law. That's neutrality and uh, independence and uh, impartiality. Uh, but you know, one of the things also with with humanitarian assistance is that it tends sometimes to bypass, uh, you know, the national ownership, whether it's national, whether it's state or non-state actors, because the humanitarian imperative is to you know, make sure that uh, food or health services or basic services go directly to the people as quickly as possible. As I said, it is in, in a life-saving mode. Uh, and then, you know, as, as, as you uh, progress through you know, the period of, of war and you know, peace agreements, uh, the idea is that uh, you know, the, the blue curve, development assistance, um, should, be, should be increasing. And again, this development assistance is all part of a poverty uh, reduction uh, strategy. Uh, you know, it looks at, uh, and uh, the, the, I think one of the main tenets of, uh, of development assistance is that it is nationally owned, that you're trying to build up the capacity uh, of, of a, uh, of a um, you know, nascent uh, administration uh, and government to take responsibility. So it is led by national uh, priorities. And I think Luca also mentioned based on uh, Paris Declaration principles. So that's you know, sort of well and good. You've got the, you know, the peak of the humanitarian activity, but very often you will see countries, as, as we see now in, in, uh, in South Sudan, that you know, suddenly the humanitarian expenditure is going to increase uh, because of uh, you know, tribal conflict, LRA activity, displacements, and, and other things. But then you've got this really sort of interesting gap, and which is the you know the the black part uh, there, and that's that's sort of what 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 I would term as really the recovery challenge. You know what happens in the kind of downturn, or you know where the peak of humanitarian <coughs> assistance, the war is over, peace agreement is signed, uh, you don't really have all the elements for you know a, a long-term development <coughs> framework to take place. And how do you make that transition? And that really is, I think, what we're all here about today. What are the kinds of things you do there? You know, what is the timing? What is the sequence? You know, uh, what activities get priority? How do you manage expectations in that period? And within that little group there, I think that, that little time period, 
critical decisions in terms of, you know, what happens, you know, do we slide back into conflict? Uh, you know, are, are, are we uh, not, you know, are we, are we uh, sort of giving rise to, you know, uh, frustrations amongst a, a, a populace uh, that, that wanted peace dividends? Uh, and, you know, what are the key things that people want? And I think getting our heads around what it is that we do how we do it, what are the mechanisms, what is the architecture, what are the coordination, what kind of funding do we need, uh, you know, what are the principles, what are the frameworks, all of that is, 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 is the key uh, in, in front of us. And I think um, that, I think, will, will still be debated in each country, as, uh, you know, Sarah said, I've been in Afghanistan, uh, you know, now in Sudan. And you can see, you know, many differences, but, uh, you know, there are critical elements within that which, which are, I think, vital. So in terms of managing the uh, recovery challenge, some of the key interventions, and again, I think they have been highlighted by, by Luca, but first, uh, assess the needs. You know, what is it that you really need to do? And uh, you know, Luca has highlighted a lot, but he was involved uh, in, the, in the joint uh, assessment uh, mission. The, between the World Bank and the United Nations and various donors, We've come up with what are, you know, how do you do post-conflict needs assessments? You know, what is the best way of, of trying to, you know, build the, the knowledge and expertise? What kind of data do you have, you know, in order to build upon what, what it is that you, that you want to do? So that assessment of, of needs. Number two is improve the basic services visibly. And I underline visibly because, again, it's, it's what the expectations are all about and what do people see and feel in terms of what they receive in, uh, you know, from, the, from a state that they have a lot of hope and you know, uh, aspirations uh, about people returning back uh, who've been refugees or displaced, uh, you know, going back to areas where the kinds of services that they were used to in a camp setting are suddenly not available in their own home setting. You know. uh, and again, so you know, a lot of expectations on, on, on the government. Number three, and I think that this to me is, is probably one of the pinnacles of early recovery, make people feel safe. And I you know, repeat this story quite often, but uh, I, I was in Afghanistan, I served in Afghanistan at the time that the Russians uh, came in. I was just starting out my career in, in, in the UN and I served in Afghanistan. And I went back to Afghanistan in uh, 2002 uh, and I remember inquiring there whether some of the people that I knew, you know, 20 years ago were still, still around. And we gathered a few, you know, there were security guards and a waiter at the, at the guest house where I used to be. And I was sitting around with them and I said, you know, if you could ask me for three things, you know, what is it that you would want? And uh, as I say, without batting an eyelid, they all said, you know, we want to feel safe. And one of them said, you know, I want my child, I want my girl to be able to go out into the street and, you know, go to school and feel safe about it. And I think, you know, what if, if you sort of parse what feel safe means and how you generate the whole, uh, you know, institutions and, and, and mechanisms around, uh, you know, uh, as, as uh, Luca said, proliferation of arms. I mean, you know, at that point, someone told me that you could probably, was telling me that I could probably go into any house in, in, in Kabul at that time and probably find two or three weapons, you know. Um, so how do you get around this feeling of insecurity? You know, how long does it take to train a police force that provides the kind of security? What are the recourse to justice if you know, people need to go to the courts? And so the whole thing that goes into making people safe, I think, is, is one of the critical elements. And that's part of stabilization. We can call it you know, whatever we want, but it's part of a stabilization mechanism. Uh, number four, in ensure good governance. And there, I think, you know, the checks and balances that we set up. Uh, you know, um, as we said, foreign assistance, ODA, all of that is flowing in. Uh, there are internal, uh, you know, revenues and resources. How do we set up the kinds of uh, mechanisms uh, which build the trust? And, you know, how do we, uh, you know, try and, and um, mitigate, uh, you know, against corruption and, you know, practices, again, very, very important to get that right in, in, in that initial state. Build up state capacity, and even though I've said quickly, I, I mean, I think that, 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 that there's, there's a huge tension in that. I mean, building up state capacity takes years. It takes, you know, 15 years, 20 years. People <coughs> need to be trained. 
but how are you going to get, I think, the fundamentals of state capacity there in order to allow the states to, to provide the services? And six, I think uh, Luca said this, and, and I also want to repeat, manage expectations. You know, what is, I mean, as I said, there are people who have come home from being refugees. There are people who were displaced. You know, there is a whole level of hope. There is euphoria after a peace agreement or, you know, after years of conflict. Uh, and then we have these big, huge, you know, donor conferences, and there are headlines that, you know, $8 billion has been pledged, or, you know, $10 billion has been pledged. Uh, and uh, as I say, I mean, I sometimes feel that people expect that, you know, we've gone to these conferences, whether it's in Oslo or Tokyo or wherever, and that we're literally coming back with bags and sacks full of money that people are going to feel in a, in a tangible way. And it doesn't happen, and the frustration set in. So how do we manage the expectations, and how do we tell people, these take time, this is going to come to you in services, and also what the own civic responsibility is. You know, the, so it's, it's, it's not that, yeah, I remember in Afghanistan, I used to always say that, you know, uh, you're not passive recipients. You know, you must be active, uh, responsible citizens as, 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 as well. And I think that's, that's true. So I think uh, very important. Let me just try and, you know, uh, just give a little bit more in terms of, uh, you know, Luca mentioned those, uh, you know, some of the key indicators. And, uh, and I just want to put Sudan's situation into perspective, and I'll run through very quickly. But if you look at aid flows to Liberia here as an example, uh, the little red line uh, shows that how much of the total aid that Liberia receives, you know, how much uh, of that is development aid. And you'll see how you get dips in, 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 in development aid. And if you look at the blue thing, the dark blue is humanitarian aid <coughs> and the uh, light blue is development. So you can see that humanitarian aid is gradually reducing as development aid is increasing. And let me just show you, since I've been to Afghanistan, let me show you how large development assistance was in Afghanistan as compared to the humanitarian assistance. And you see the tremendous amount of development assistance that's, uh, that's gone there you know, as, as a total share of, uh, of uh, overall aid, close to 90%. And then I show you uh, the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo, where you see the peak in humanitarian assistance. Uh, and then, you know, the tapering off of that uh, with, you know, development assistance having a lion's share. But now let me show you what happens in Sudan. And you will see that the bulk of assistance in, in Sudan is in humanitarian assistance. The bulk of it is in humanitarian assistance. And of that humanitarian assistance, just to, you know, we, I'll show you aggregated information later. But if you look at that line, the red line, you will see that less than 50% consistently, whereas in all the other countries, the lines went up and above the 50%. In Sudan, it is consistently below 50% uh, in terms of uh, humanitarian uh, assistance. And um, you know, so very often we do get you know, queries from government saying, you know, where is all the aid that was uh, pledged in all these conferences? And we always say it went in humanitarian assistance, because the bulk of it went in humanitarian assistance. Now, putting, uh, and let me say that the bulk of this is also in, in Darfur. So uh, just, just so that you know that this is not, uh, you know, in uh, southern Sudan receives about 30% in humanitarian assistance. So that's much less. But this is overall Sudan, and the bulk of it goes to Darfur. And, you know, that's why there's such a huge, uh, you know, the flows, external flows coming in, going to, to humanitarian assistance. Now, if I put Sudan's uh, situation into perspective in terms of human development indicators, you know, you see where all the countries were in two, 2000, and you s compare it to, to, to countries that were all in the same situation in 2000, and you see that, you know, Sudan has, has, has progressed on the Human Development Index. That's the, that's the red line. So overall, Sudan's economy is, is growing, as you'll see in the, in the, in the next uh, graph. Uh, and if you compare it to developing countries, or if you compare it to the dark dotted line, which is Africa, you can see that Sudan is on a traje trajectory of, uh, of, uh, of growth and that, uh, you know, the, um, uh, where the per capita incomes have doubled in Africa since 1985, in Sudan it has, it has tripled. Now, again, this is for overall Sudan, and I'll come to specifics of, uh, of South Sudan. But also, as you see the uh, growth of the economy and um, uh, human development index, you also see that Sudan has a population 
uh, that rose from 19 million in 1983 to 39 million, and that's one of the highest growths of, of uh, population. Now, let me just, as a perspective, also tell you that you know in Sudan we're dealing with a vast country, and what the next slide you'll you'll see is is that you know Sudan we always talk about as a continent, uh, because you can see how France, uh, you know, the Netherlands, uh, Burundi, Afghanistan, Zimbabwe, Sierra Leone are all included, and there's still there's still land left over. Uh, so, so it is, you know, as we do, talk about it as a, as a continent. And, and the very many challenges that, that, that it faces in Darfur, with humanitarian aid to 4.7 million people, the East, which is always telling us that, you know, we, we forget uh, the East, it's a forgotten crisis. There's protracted refugee situation in the three areas uh, of uh, ABA also, where we've had the permanent court uh, of uh, arbitration agreement. In the South right now, with tremendous challenges of budgetary pressure, tribal conflict, food crisis and uh, protection. And nationally, as, uh, as Luca also mentioned, we've got CPA milestones, we've got an election, referendum, border demarcation, uh, you know, lots of things which were in the peace agreement, all compressed within a 13-month time period that is before us and negotiations going on for a peace process in Darfur. So it is a, uh, a country of uh, you know, immense uh, uh, complexity. Now, Luca mentioned about the, uh, you know, the extreme, uh, you know, uh, the, how, how uh, the indicators in, in South Sudan uh, are right now in terms of the attention particularly to um, human development and the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. And let me just show you, we've got the gray, the larger area, which is the north. And if you look at n uh, primary school attendance, you will see that you know, in the north it's over 80%, but on the left-hand side, which is the south, you will see that it is reaching a little bit uh, close to 40%. And you can s compare it to other countries in, in Africa. Again, maternal mortality, as he said, one of the highest in the world. And uh, in South Sudan, you can see that it's almost close to 2,200 uh, uh, per 100,000 births. And um, in the north, much less. Um, so again, this is where the regional disparities are. On access to improved situation, again, in the south, you see that it's below 20%, whereas in the north, it is close to 80%. Same thing with infant mortality. So all of these indicators, you know, talk about the dire needs, not only in a post-conflict situation, but where you're starting out from a baseline of some of the worst indicators that there are with respect to infant mortality, maternal mortality. So, you know, again, it's a question of how do you prioritize, where do you put the emphasis, and, you know, where does, how do you allocate uh, budget uh, in, 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 in the face of these kind of situations? Yeah, I'll wind up very quickly. So, if you look at this, the, the social services, uh, you see that, uh, you know, we were talking about, Luca mentioned about the wage bill and the amount that goes into security, and that's the red part. Uh, and again, a lot of this is wages paid to, as, as he said, you know, armed movements who have, who have, uh, you know, um, fought valiantly during, during, during the war, and uh, you know, you can't leave them out in the cold. So you know, there are salary payments, there's wage bills, and other things that need to, to, to be going. Uh, but then, on the other hand, if you look at, you know, how much of the budget goes on health, you see that it's only two, two percent. And yet, this is something, again, I was saying that, you know, the tangible, you know, where do people see the tangible difference? And on the Common Humanitarian Fund, uh, which, which he said I would speak to, and I'm going to rush through very quickly, you'll see that the bulk of the Common Humanitarian Fund, uh, uh, more than 50 uh, uh, percent, uh, close to uh, 50, a little bit more than 60 uh, percent, goes on food aid. And again, part of the, much of this is, is uh, you know, uh, uh, going to, to Darfur. But if you compare the amount of food aid and then see that only, uh, you know, two, uh, about 5% goes on agriculture and another 5% goes on early recovery, which we're talking about as the, as the crucial, crucial times. So in terms of public revenue then, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, Sudan is is uh, oil uh, exporting nation. They've got oil uh, revenues, 
and uh, you know government revenues both by uh, oil and and uh, and taxes and about uh, you know close to 7 billion dollars that that have uh, that have um, flowed in oil revenues but again you know we were talking about the capacity the institutional the uh, you know the government institutions uh, rule of law the control of uh, corruption the <coughs> regulatory qualities all these are things that have to be done but they take time uh, they need institutions, they need laws, they need regulatory frameworks. And again, if you look at this uh, slide where you see the amount that goes into capacity building as a total of all uh, foreign assistance, you'll see that in the case of Sudan, it is the lowest. The least amount of money is going into capacity building. And again, you need to make sure that that's enhanced. So let me just say what, uh, what I feel are some of the key uh, defining priorities. And this one slide, I think, there on looking at where the tensions right now in South Sudan are, where a country, while it's looking at, at uh, early recovery needs, again, has to deal with LRA incursions in the South, is looking at displacements, is looking at a refugee situation, and is looking at displacements from <coughs> intertribal conflicts. So I would say that the key priorities are one is, as I said, stabilize. And I think I have to say stability, stabilization, you know, whatever it is, but stabilize and make people feel secure. And, you know, there are many things that, that, uh, that go into that. Uh, number two is to build the state capacity. You must have the face of the nation. You must have the face of the, of, uh, you know, of a government or a state providing for its people. And I think that is very, very important. Uh, to make the face of, of the government, that the people feel that it is the, you know, the, the government that's providing it. Lay the foundations for recovery, uh, strengthen uh, governance, which is the accountability frameworks, you know, review and clean up public payrolls. It's so important to get right procurement and budgetary procedures immediately and the salary payments. I mean, those are three critical things that, that need to be done right away. Uh, the um, uh, fifth is, of course, saving lives wherever there's a humanitarian imperative that must come and we must respond to that. Uh, and, and finally is, is, is the whole uh, recovery challenge. So, you know, there's a lot, lot to do uh, in that early recovery um, period. Uh, right now, as Luca said, there's an election uh, ongoing. It's, it's, you know, it is supposed to look at the transformation to, to democracy. But as I also agree that in a peace agreement, there is a tendency in a very short period to lump in many, many benchmarks. So while a, a nascent government is trying to get started and trying to get many uh, you know, uh, mechanisms and systems in place, uh, they also simultaneously have to be dealing with, with a lot of the other transformative benchmarks uh, as, as, as well. So I think that is you know, what, what I define as the early recovery challenge and mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samia.